Welcome, friends. It's almost midnight, and you've found your way to the Pikecast. Come along as we careen through the catalog of the most formative horror writer of our young adult days, Christopher Pike. From adult perspectives, we'll revisit these YA books our parents probably would never have let us read had they known what lie inside. We tackle one book per episode in a freewheeling and unbiased chat. So grab your battered paperback, pull the flashlight from the kitchen drawer, climb under your bed covers, and devour a good book with us. Greetings, fellow pikers, and welcome to the PikeCast. I'm Cooper Beckett, and I'm thrilled to be joined by my lovely co-hosts. Hello, I'm Cassie. Hi, I'm Becca. Today, we're digging into Christopher Pike's 1990 book, Witch, and we're going to be dissecting it in great detail, spoiling each and every plot twist. So consider yourself warned. If you're enjoying the PikeCast, please leave us a review on the podcast service of your choice. Our guest piker this week is Jen Adams, author of Strong Female Antagonist blog and co-host of the awesome podcast Psychoanalysis and the Losers Club. We have another loser here. Welcome, Jen. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. <laughs> We're so happy to have you here. I'm excited. So, Jen, we have a few questions we like to ask every guest who comes on the podcast, and Cassie's going to take that over today. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you discovered Christopher Pike? Um, so I discovered Christopher Pike, I think, probably at the Bookmobile. Um, I, was, <laughs> <laughs> nice. I was obsessed with this um, every summer, and I just ate up scary stuff. Uh, and I must have seen, I think probably I found Christopher Pike through Fear Street, um, mm -hmm. even though I know that is Earl Stein. But I think back then I just thought, all of this type of literature was Fear Street, and so <laughs> when it's all the like Fear Street genre, it kind yeah exactly yeah that's just kind of what I considered it, and I I like to kind of think I predate Goosebumps, um, so <laughs> like, <laughs> so I went straight from the Babysitters Club book where Stacy babysits at maybe the haunted house, and then Ooh. I found like Fear Street, and then Christopher Pike, and it was just like it was over for me. I was hooked. And then I moved pretty quickly to Stephen King, which well, is... Well, yes, yes. Yeah. I love that because that's... I mean, well, I had a little bit more V.C. Andrews through in there, but mm, other than I that... I had some V.C. Andrews I too. <laughs> but the Babysitter's Club, I loved Babysitter's Club, and so I would read those, and then I would also read Fear Street, and my dad was like, are those... Those look like different kinds of books. And I was like, oh, they are. They're very different kinds of books. <laughs> Just a little bit, yeah. Just a little. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, I think the the most scary thing that ever happened in a Babysitter's Club book was like Stacy saw some flies by a window and it was kind of like the Amityville horror. And oh, no. <laughs> yeah, and they was have like, like I the need Halloween more. ones and that's it. They were like kind of spooky, <laughs> but not not scary. Right. Spooky yeah. If you're like if you're maybe babysitting in your home alone with the baby. Well, yeah, that, <laughs> right. that could be scary. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so what's the thing that keeps Christopher Pike on your mind after all this time? Um, well, probably Stephen King, you know, I just I still love to read horror fiction, I find myself rereading, or re listening to a lot of Stephen King audiobooks, especially the earlier ones, kind of like the vintage King ones, mm. which are very similar to kind of Fear Street, it's a different style of writing. But I mean, it's like, at this point, it's kind of nostalgia for me, you know, and it's like, I feel I, I went a long time without even really thinking about Earl Stein and Christopher Pike and this type of this the genre. And then um, I think probably with Stranger Things, I was like, Ooh, I oh, remember yeah. that I loved those books. And like reading them, it's like it kind of just washes over you and it's soothing. You don't have to think too hard about it. <laughs> like, oh, this is so nice. And it just took me back to like the 90s. And you know, the bookmobile days. Very nice. <laughs> Can I please like be told about this bookmobile because I'm jealous and I want to know all about it. <laughs> oh my gosh! Okay, so the bookmobile was amazing. It's like a bus that has a library inside it, or like an oh, RV wow. that's mm -hmm. just full of library like shelves of books, and so it would like travel around. 
um, just the county. And so on, it was either like Tuesdays or Thursdays, it would come near our house and I would like beg my mom to take us to the bookmobile. And so we would just go into this like book RV thing and I would just load up on, um, I remember getting a lot of um, Christopher Pike and a lot of um, Fear Street and a lot of kind of Babysitter's Club. I think this was a little bit before I was into Stephen King. Um, and I also remember getting books of Garfield and Farside um, oh, yeah. comics yeah, also. Yeah. <laughs> so it was just kind of like it wasn't the most expansive collection, but it was it was amazing. I, mean, I have very sweet. fond memories. Yeah, yeah. it was very I, cool. I would love to check one of them out, even though I don't know if they're still a thing. <laughs> I don't know if they're still a thing, but they should be because they're really I wish they would be replaced by the, the tiny local libraries, the tiny oh, little yeah, those li- are cute. The book libraries. Yeah. Yeah. What are your favorite Christopher Pike books? <laughs> um, okay, Chain Letters, the Chain Letter books. I love, yeah. loved. Um, I also really was into the Cheerleader series, and I know he didn't write all of them, but those were my favorites. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, mail can be scary. And it was just it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because when you're little, mail is very exciting. I know. I remember I used to, like, like send out for mail order my little ponies and getting them in the mail. <laughs> so <laughs> cute. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, oh my gosh, the but what if I get a chain before the letter? internet, yeah. I know, Love man. It. I checked the mail every day for like three weeks until it finally came. <laughs> did anybody else do that um, thing that I did several times where you used like a million different names and ordered six CDs and promised to pay for one of them but then never did? Oh, I, did no. I did movies. I did oh. the VHS club. All yeah. of my first CDs were because of those things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did that. What was it? Columbia House? Yeah. 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 And like the BMG, whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And then you realize how much money you're actually stuck paying. <laughs> Like, yeah, oh, well, but then I was like, yeah, good luck collecting that from Cassie Grasshopper. <laughs> Who the hell is that? I don't, the 11-year-old me thought Cassie Grasshopper was a great name, and so good luck. But I've got the CDs still. Somebody wow. out there still looking for Cassie Grasshopper to like, yeah. get their money. No, there's, Not there's only a... that, I would do uh, different insects and different animals every single time, but it was always Cassie something. Oh, wow. Oh, God, I bet they so had like cute. a whole team of like Columbia House people like on your case. Yeah. Yes, there's the there's a big team. collections. Right. So the, the the debt has been sold multiple times right. over the years. Suspect they likes the bugs. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's change gears a little bit. I can't, I can't change them. This is too good. <laughs> I'm just thinking of Cassie Grasshopper now. I know. <laughs> I love when I accidentally like share these bits of myself that I don't ever tell other people. I'm so happy that you do. Yeah, me too. Me too. That's why. That's why. It's it's why we enjoy podcasting. <laughs> um, <laughs> Becca, you have the unenviable task oh, God, of yeah. reading the most massive back of the book I think we've <laughs> we've had thus far. I would be shocked if it doesn't reveal literally everything about the blood, but I have not read it. So, take it away, Becca. Okay. She was a good witch. Julia is a young woman with extraordinary powers. She has the ability to heal people with her touch. She can also know things that are happening in far-off places when she looks in water that has sunlight shining on it. She comes from a tradition of witches, of good witches. But before Julia's mother died, she warned her daughter never to look into the water that had moonlight shining on it. Unfortunately, almost by accident, Julia does so. What she sees is a vision of the future, a scene in which a young man she does not know is shot in a holdup and dies in her arms. Only later, when Julia attends a football game at school, does she meet the young man. He is her girlfriend's new boyfriend. (laughs) This is so long. I know. (laughs) Like a fourth fourth of the way through. It's like a treatment of the book. It's 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 what Christopher Pike sent the publisher. Like, this is the next book. (laughs) Julia immediately falls for the guy but it is ill-fated love he does not belong to her and he is supposed to die or does he have to die Julia doesn't know if her vision of the future is set (laughs) or if it can be changed she doesn't know why the gunman in her vision evokes such hatred in her and why she feels she must destroy him at all costs but using the supernatural powers at her command and risking her own life plus the lives of her friends Julia will find the answer to all of these questions at a terrible cost Dun dun dun! <laughs> Good God, that was that was a mouthful, my dude. That that is a lot of book right there. 
a lot of for plot. a book that doesn't really have that much plot. No, you know? that's you know, that's very true. <laughs> like they they literally, uh, I mean, they yeah, wow. Like okay. except for the resolution, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the artwork. We're back to Brian Kotsky after a few weeks of uh, other artists, and this is this is a classic Brian Kotsky painting here. Uh, I absolutely love it. Me too. <laughs> glad, glad your votes, uh, feelings of the others. I, know, I really like it. Up, yeah, I like the mysterious figure behind her. Yeah, yeah. that's his, that's the aunt, right? I, I, I assume so. so. Yeah. Yeah. She looks so much like creepier than I feel like. She's just like an old woman dressed in like black, right? Like. Yeah. Well, I. Yeah. I uh, you've seen um, Ready or Not, right? Mm -hmm. okay. oh, I just yeah. picture uh -huh. the, the old grumpy uh, ant woman from that. Yes. Oh, <laughs> my favorite character in that movie. <laughs> oh, yeah. She's so great. She is good, yeah. yeah. Now, what I like about this cover is it uses our color scheme, the uh, the, yeah. the, the green and the hot, hot pink. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. There, I mean, there's this is, this is a very, like, classic pike cover. This... Um, when I think of a Pike cover, it's this and Whisper of Death, really, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, yeah. I, I, I think it's great. It's Such very good intriguing. Trees. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice, nice tree work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sorry. I just sound like an idiot. I'm like, oh, the trees, guys. But I just, <laughs> it's I just cool. felt like, like Bob Ross would approve. He yeah. would. Yeah. <laughs> it's very mysterious. may not be happy, though. They may not no. be happy. Like, no, I, I guess they had the faces carved into them. That would have been cool. That would have been cool, but confusing. For yeah. The yeah. Yes. Yeah, I thought fair. that that was like hedge animals at first. Like, that's how I read that. <laughs> and I was picturing him like draw, like carving these massive faces in like yeah, he's shrubs. he's just back there like Edward Scissorhands <laughs> doing <Right>. <laughs> it's like It doesn't seem as sweet as I think he thinks it <laughs> uh, So did these accurately capture what's inside? I think with the back covering almost the entire plot pretty much so. well, that's safe to say <laughs> yeah i think it sets up more of a confrontation with uh the ant than we ever really get but well, let's, i mean let's yeah. be fair the book itself sets up a confrontation with the ant that we don't get <laughs> that's true yes <laughs> i think it's weird that the back of the book doesn't mention her best friend at all who's like a pretty who's the character. second pov character mm -hmm. yeah it's it's really an interesting structure, this book, because I think Amy, um, I mean, obviously, this is this is a little bit advanced, but I think Amy feels more like the traditional Pike heroine mm -hmm. with somebody taking her boyfriend and uh, trying to figure out what's going on. Like, she's far more, uh, yeah, traditional Pike heroine. I don't know why I'm saying that again. <laughs> um, yeah. But let's talk about Julia Florence, who is our red-haired, green-eyed heroine from this. Uh, Julia's beauty was undeniable. Her fine red hair spun to her waist in careless waves. The color changed shades with the seasons. In the summer, it was shiny gold. In the winter, dark and grave. Yet her eyes were always bright, two green jewels that could look right into a person. And we literally have to wait like 30 pages for a description of her because Amy gives it to us in her first point of view chapter. And it's basically like we look the same, right? Yeah, Except really. Julie is beautiful. So we yeah. just wear each other's clothes, right? Yeah, they're, they're the same. They're 5'5 five five and, and the same build. Yeah. 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 I've been watching uh, Cruel Summer recently. <laughs> and so I've just had all of those characters in my head. And so I've been picturing <laughs> Amy as the mom from Cruel. Not Amy. Uh, Julia as the mom from Cruel Summer. Gotcha. Did you finish it? No, I've got one episode left oh, and I cannot mm, wait. Okay. I'll just wait until you're done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have such feelings. <laughs> yeah. It, this, it's really good. <laughs> It's felt like I'm living in the 90s this week, which has been yes. very nice. <laughs> are, did you? Are you just marathoning it all at once now that it's over? Or I am. Yeah, I That's just started smart. it the other day. I was like, it's oh. my form. I, I was doing then... the week to week, and it was awful. Oh, oh, I, I was bet. like, where's the next part? Like, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm officially over the whole week to week thing. I don't. Me like too. It. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My attention span is not good for that. I forget yeah. what happened, and like they show me a recap, and I'm still like, uh, who's this guy? I don't right. remember exactly. this guy. Yeah. 
it's it's binging has broken us really mm-hmm. yeah what we're, what we're saying in the best way though because i really like a good binge especially when i'm Me on bed too. rest mm-hmm. oh yeah i bet so back to talking about julia <laughs> <laughs> julia is our good witch from this book uh she is the titular witch uh she's 17 again very pike um what do you what do you think about Julia? I really like the the like I feel like he's really really tripping over himself to try to say she's a good witch, she's not yeah. an evil witch, you know, which I really appreciate. Um but uh you know, I <laughs> she just doesn't seem like a real character or she doesn't seem like she allows herself to be a human being, which is kind of I um, agree. Yeah. You know, yeah, like I got really frustrated um with some of the like advice that her mother was giving her and just kind of these really, really rigid standards that she's holding herself to. And the understanding of her just as a witch in general is odd, feels odd to me. And I don't, I don't feel like she is learning about herself throughout the book. I think that would have been far more interesting for her as a character is mm-hmm. to be learning about what she is able to do. She kind of knows what she's able to do, except for the, uh, you know, grab the fat man who's actually 16's <laughs> heart. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's, I mean, it, also she's she's got this this recurring Pike thing where it's the girl who doesn't really want her friend's boyfriend attracted to her, mm-hmm. but since he is, she loves him too. Right, immediately. Yeah, and that that's come up a bunch, and it feels just shitty every time it does. Mm-hmm. Because Amy is a sweet, sweet person. She is, and, and really the only thing we know about her is that she's okay with this. You yeah. know, is that she just kind of accepts that her fate is to always lose these guys to uh, Julia. We don't really learn that much about her as a person. You know? Which sucks. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think Amy's in love with Julie and just doesn't realize it yet because they're very young. And so I think she, yeah, I think she's super hard crushing on Julia. And also, I think Julia is just really annoying because any character who's going <laughs> to martyr themselves for a basic ass little white teenager is just like this basic man. She's like, you have screenplays to write. Dude, you can heal people. You're fucking magical. Are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. What could he? No, 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 no. She lost me. And that made me so mad at her because. <laughs> She was so much cooler when she was like a a powerful witch who did stuff. And then she's like, this is my purpose to save this little boy. And then not little boy, but, you know, her friend, whatever. It was just, I was so over that. I was like, come on. There's like a million dudes like him out there. There's one you. What are you doing? Yeah. Julia, please. For self-worth. <laughs> she's got to work on it. But she, now she's, she can't. So she she's <laughs> tight. Good thing the basic little dude lived, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. He's got to make his screenplay about the haunted, like, answering machine. Or yeah, something. haunted oh. answering machine. Christ. Like, oh, oh. <laughs> and what, what's game. really funny about that, and this is, we're, we're, we're jumping over Amy to Scott really quickly. <laughs> Scott <laughs> feels like the Pike surrogate. Yeah. But then because Pike fridges him, which to those who don't know is the term for getting rid of a character, he recreates him as Randy. Mm-hmm. Which is just a slightly worse version of Scott. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's like he wanted Scott to be in the whole book, but oh, I accidentally almost killed him. Well, here's another Scott for you. Yeah, just a little bit worse. Yeah, like there feels like a few too many characters in this book, which is a Pike trope. But yeah, it really, uh, it's interesting. Let's let's talk about Amy. Uh, and you you mentioned the the feelings. Amy Bell thought Julia Florence was the most intriguing girl in the world. So intriguing that when she was young, meeting Julia got rid of her imaginary friend. See, yeah, no, I I totally I totally buy that Amy is in love with Julia. Mm-hmm. And- I think that's why I don't think she's straight, and I don't. I don't even know if she leans toward guys so much as that it's expected of her. And that's why she has like all these boyfriends, but cause why? Like I can, that's the only reason I can imagine for like being like, yeah, this girl keeps stealing my boyfriends. That's fine. Like yeah. I'd mm-hmm. steal my boyfriend. Like I, if I were the boyfriend, I'd go with her too. Like I'm in love with her. Like, of course, like, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and here's, here's Amy's description of, we've heard Amy's description of Julia. Here's hers of herself. 
Amy was not like Julia, and she knew it. She was not beautiful. She was not mysterious. Her plain blonde hair didn't glisten in the sun. The light of dawn didn't shine in her ordinary blue eyes. But she did have a great figure, and she liked to think she was funny. <laughs> oh, <laughs> she sounds Amy. fine. She yeah, does. She sounds, she sounds fine. Yeah, I, it, it makes me feel bad. Yeah, I, I would. I would have liked to see Amy as the the protagonist, honestly. Mm-hmm. And I mean, this is really. <laughs> Or the way the way she loses, ah, I can't. No, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. I, <laughs> okay, let's talk a little bit more about Scott. <laughs> Amy was having a small salad, and Scott was working on two hamburgers. Scott had never had a weight problem, but over the summer, he had developed a respectable belly. This this is my favorite line, though, to show you how crazy Scott is. <laughs> Look at him right now, she thought. He took a bite of one hamburger, (laughs) put it down, then took a bite of the other. I respect that. (laughs) Crazy! Maybe he put different condiments on each one, and he's like, okay, here's my mustard bite, Mm, and here's my ketchup bite. Mm." Like, I can understand it. Oh, I totally do. It's it's, it's just the weirdest thing to consider. Look how crazy he is. Right. Look at how crazy he is. (laughs) He's the real witch here. (laughs) The real witch was the friends we made along the way. (laughs) If he had 10 burgers and he was taking one bite out of every single one and then just like, mmm, patting his belly like that was a burger's worth. Yeah, totally. Like, he's, he's, he's... one step away from being wimpy from Popeye in this in this description, honestly. Right. I would love to go have lunch with Scott. <laughs> I would I would also eat multiple burgers with him. <laughs> when and here we, we have this is this is great. Both of the women are very fat shamey about him. Uh, mm-hmm. but besides, she wasn't attracted to Scott. It wasn't his fault that he wasn't handsome in a classic way. His face was perfectly round, and his skin tone was ruddy, slightly orangish, which I know we're all traumatized from orange skin folk, so we're just going to have to remember <laughs> this was written in 1990. Oh, I was picturing an Oompa Loompa. <laughs> I was picturing Pumpkinhead. <laughs> different interpretations and you guys are both right no no totally she and amy had nicknamed him the great pumpkin Mm. the blue in his eyes was as bright as that of a christmas tree light julia watched as he reached for a bag of french fries and saw amy poke his belly and mouth the word fat now i want to remind everybody this is julia's vision so that means Amy and Scott are hanging out. Scott is not aware that Amy is mouthing the word fat. That means Amy is literally just poking her friend's fat and mouthing the word fat to herself. Oh, she couldn't just think it. Yeah. Oh, I thought I thought she was saying it, but because she doesn't have sound in her visions, he, she's mouthing it. So she was telling it to him like you're fat. Oh, well, that's yeah. even worse. I know. Yeah. No, yeah, it is. It was awful. But that's what I thought it was, though. Like she was like, because like going, I don't know, like. I picture like siblings, like young siblings who don't understand like sure, that, okay, why that's so okay, shitty. Yeah. So poking somebody and like you're eating two burgers, you're fat, and like, <laughs> so, and when it said mouthing, I don't know because otherwise, yeah, it does seem weird. Like, why? What yeah. are you doing, girl? Yeah. When they have lo- they have known each other since they were very little. Yeah. So, yeah. So and maybe that's why the sibling thing. Maybe they do have that kind of relationship. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I thought their relationship was kind of sweet in a mm-hmm. way, um, other than the fat shaming, which kind yeah. of just seems like par for the course in this novel. Well, and in Pike in general, we need yeah. someone who's fat to shame. Mm. Well, and we have a couple of them in this <laughs> one. Um, but it's weird that like him taking two bites of burger is the thing that makes him weird and not him like conning this 30 year old woman yes. into like yes. going to high school football games with him or something. So, yeah, he, he invites a 30 year old woman who he's convinced he's, he's much older. This this poor dumb woman. Seriously. Oh. But. Also, then he's 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 just filming the cheerleaders uh, for their look how cute our underwear is routine, according mm-hmm. to this. Um, and, and I really, 
I really love that uh, Julia is so snarky about this. All around, the game was a disappointment to everyone except Scott, who captured excellent footage for his upcoming documentary on cheerleader bottoms. <sighs> yeah, like, I feel like they go out of their way to make Scott, like, a, a kind of pleasant guy, you know? And every time, like, I have it, like, I read an interaction with him, I'm like, okay, he's nice. And then every detail I found out about his life, I'm like, this person is a monster. I hate him. You know? <laughs> and this is who Julia decides to give her life for, yeah, her magical-ass life. Ass life that she can heal people and make the world better. This, mm-hmm. this yep. little loser who cons 30 year old women waitresses who have one day off a week and could be doing something better mm-hmm. oh i'm so mad i'm just trying to finish this cheerleader documentary you know so thank you julia yeah yeah <laughs> we don't need you oh yeah it, he's it, he's it, such like what's the guy from die softly oh he, uh herb herb yeah he, oh, he's got yeah. such herb vibes him and randy both and i'm just not here for it oh well they are the same character yeah <laughs> yeah Ugh. Except Scott was a whiz at writing screenplays and using his camcorder. According to a 15-year-old girl. Come on. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, he's 17. Now, oh, those not, two years. Hang on. Not, You're right. Let's not just jettison all her, uh, all her agency because she's young. <laughs> okay, let's move on to uh, no personality boyfriend, Jim Kovic. Basic hmm. white man. Six yeah. foot two and built like a god. <laughs> he was amazingly nimble on his feet. He lifted weights regularly, and his thick, dark hair was a perpetual mess. This is a recurring thing, too. Have you noticed that? All all their, their hot guys uh, don't seem to pay any attention to their hair. Because mm, they don't have to. No, I guess. Okay. Uh, it was all she could do to not run her fingers through it. There was a gentleness to him, a shyness. And when he smiled, he looked all of six years old. That's so creepy. Like that line right there turned me off so fast. <laughs> so, yeah, Jim, uh, he, he almost has no personality at all, really. Right. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's nothing <laughs> except for he has like darker, longer hair, which I mean, if I <laughs> if I can kind of think like if he's comparing that to like a crew cutty person, like a boy or like the, your standard like jock football player, could he be implying that he is like more sensitive and more kind of yeah. empathetic mm-hmm. than your like typical jock? But we don't see him do any of that stuff. No, really. We, we all we know is that he just started dating Amy mm-hmm. and he immediately falls in love with Julia. Right. And he plays football. Yeah. It's it's weird. <laughs> yeah. And uh like the the conversation that he has with Amy when he's in the hotel with her. It's like, "Are you still in love with me?" she asks quietly. "I can't talk about stuff like that right now." <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh... But this one this one really bothered me, and I don't know why it bothered me so much. Julia nodded. It was like being in hell, she added. I was dreaming about Scott and me. Jim lowered his head. Were you two ever involved? So Jim is in a relationship. And he's jealous of Julia's friend Scott, who's dying. (sighs) Oh, Jim. Yeah, I kept waiting for some kind of larger connection between Jim and Julia. Like, did they know each other in a past life? I was like, are no. they brother and sister? Because we didn't know who her dad was for <laughs> yeah, a while. Yeah, there you go. Oh, okay. It's like, what's good? But there's nothing. Like, he is nothing. No, literally know? all it is is Julia's a witch, so people are attracted to her. It sounds like. Right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um. Let's see. Yeah, and this is uh, this just happened. I'm always irritated with the uh <laughs> what we call the romantic thirstiness of some of uh <laughs> some of Pike's characters but this feels like exceedingly uh obnoxious he was disappointed but he squeezed her hand and nodded his head i know i can't talk about you what do you mean he stared at the window but because the curtains were drawn he saw nothing julia only had a vague idea where they were they had driven for about 30 miles I can't talk about the way I feel about you. But you are. <laughs> You're yeah. talking about it. And then, yeah. then we get, we get uh, she had noticed the way he was looking at her, plus a minute more, and she would have made the same confession. Why 
It's why is she in love with Jim? I understand if she's a witch and there's an unnatural pull, he could be in love with her. And that's what we're supposed to believe. But why does she love him? Maybe she's really into oatmeal. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she wants him because like, I don't know. If there's this <laughs> weird kind of like power thing where like she's Amy's boyfriend. So of course she's supposed to be in love with him. You know, that's oh, yeah, OK. Work. So maybe she's she's embracing the role. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, she the thing is, she doesn't really have much of a personality either. And no, it that's feels true. Like that's her true. entire life is like she kind of exists to do what people think she's supposed to do, you know? So I don't know. Maybe she just really likes that hair, you know? <laughs> well, she she always is talking about how she can't resist running her fingers through it. So it wouldn't be surprising. <laughs> now, to be fair, I do remember some dreamy people from my uh, high school years, and I couldn't tell you anything about them now, but I do remember what their hair looked like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, it kind of gets... No, that's yeah. fair. That's fair. I think it could be, too, because that was the first time that she did, like, the moon-looking thing, and that mm, was what she mm-hmm. saw. So she probably feels because okay. she that's what she saw, and that's a person. She didn't know him. So when she meets him, she has this, like, sense of, like, oh, I already know you and I'm connected to you, which doesn't – it's not really that, but it's just because she'd already seen him and she watched him in the little moon. Window. So, Cassie, your your uh, your your idea there, I, I'm going to take it a little bit further and fix this problem. In her vision, let's say, she sees them having uh, an intimate moment. And that gives her the the love for him. That, that would be fine. But all she sees is him dying. Well, that's an intimate moment. He's I, okay, yeah, fine. dying. <laughs> also, her mom just died three months yeah. ago. So it could be she just kind of wants some like physical affection, you know, and she's just kind of a little mixed up. Well, both know? Scott and Randy would be happy to give her the physical she wants it from affection oatmeal she's looking only. for. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> Unproblematic oatmeal, not problematic oatmeal. <laughs> right, yeah. She wants it from oatmeal she's into, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, let's talk about Randy Classic. Um, he was Indian Pole High, and we're going to talk about that. Biggest side of beef. Amy had gone out with him once against her better judgment, and she wouldn't be surprised if he excelled at wrestling this year. You get it? Because he wrestled uh, with her. Uh, oh. Uh, oh. Yeah, Ooh. that's that's the joke. Whenever he was bored, he ate. That was the reason he was as big as he was. Same. He had principles. <laughs> For example, he always took a shower before he went out with a girl. Oh, wow. Uh-huh. Stand up guy. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I've met some guys who didn't even do that. So I'm just going to throw that out there. At least at least thank you to him for that. <laughs> really? I mean, because yeah. even... Even over the last uh, you know year, when when all uh, all types of self care have fallen by the wayside, if I'm going to see other people, I still take a shower. Yeah, I I don't know. I yeah, some people weird. are just like, here's me and my stank. You'll love it, and you're like, no, I do not love it. <laughs> and they're like, oh, she's like shock face, and I don't yeah. get that. But eh, sorry. Oh, what do you want from me? Take a shower before I see you. Come on, <laughs> apply deodorant. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh man. So let's. Uh, so Randy's <laughs> interesting because he seems like a far less formed version of Scott. Like he's just a collection of things. <laughs> um, he puts an entire peanut in his mouth and spits out the shell. Now, I've never done that. I don't know that that's possible. No, you're supposed to do that with sunflower seeds. But yeah, not right. Peanut. <laughs> it's a fucking peanut. <laughs> you you say. shell those and then put them in your mouth. Oh right. my god, I'm picturing Christopher Pike writing this right now, and he's just like, yeah, story checks out. Peanut, whole thing in the mouth, <laughs> pop it right out like a fucking sunflower seed. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a. Can you imagine trying to chew a peanut out of its shell? No, no. I like that's how elephants eat them. I think. <laughs> Weird. Just, yeah. uh, you got to fact check. <laughs> here's another fact. great Randy moment. Once, while eating at a fast food joint, a girl Ooh. from school suggested that one shake was enough for him. Now, seriously, bitch. Yeah, I mean. But he took her advice. He poured the second shake over her head and just <laughs> drank the first. 
Oh, that part so, made me so mad. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, um, I I do. Uh, I, I'm going to say I un- ironically love it when he's pretending to be a doctor and he specifically gets an uh, OBGYN uh, badge. Because <laughs> I think that's hilarious. <laughs> he, Especially he has- because the code is too small. And then he winds up being asked to help a pregnant woman. <laughs> that's like a sitcom moment. That's not a, that's not a, a serious novel moment. Yeah, he feels like he like is a character from Jackass, like one that they didn't <laughs> let on the show, you know? <laughs> Maybe not as like getting hurt all the time, but yeah. Well, yeah, these aren't things that human beings actually do. Exactly. Exactly. So so Randy is uh not classic uh, <laughs> when it comes to character. Okay, let's talk about Sally Hanlon, a character who doesn't exist except to be stupid enough to serve the plot. Yes. I was I was honestly shocked when she came back. Mm-hmm. It was like, whoa, okay. They're actually giving us a reason to use but seriously, she could be lifted out of this book and it won't make any difference whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like the only function she really serves is to get Amy or no Julia into Scott's room. Yeah. Right. Which I feel like there are other ways that could have been done. Yeah, like hide behind a plant or something. <laughs> and it's not like the room was being protected. It's not like there was a cop outside. It's just hospital policy she's flouting. Mm-hmm. Well, know. and she exists to kind of shame some overweight nurses also because <laughs> yes, she's filming them. And so he could just throw that in. You know? That's true because the working class mm-hmm. are slovenly. Lieutenant Crawley, the <laughs> the least likable cop character in all of Pikedom thus far, I think, because most of the cops in Pikedom are somewhat uh, decent at their job and ultimately work toward figuring it out. But this guy, like he's he's so awful that he blames a teenager for his. Uh, 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 arson so as to not reveal that he was with his mistress. Yeah, it really feels like the only reason he exists is because it would seem completely unbelievable for cops not to investigate any of this. Very and true. so we just got get a cop who shows up and does nothing and is kind of a joke. <laughs> Except give us another extended interrogation scene this one only (laughs) lasted like four or five pages but it's still when some chapters are four or five pages why are we spending this kind of time with uh, a cop it's just just to give our characters the roadblock of cop really Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and it goes nowhere you know it goes nowhere let's talk about frank truckwater which is a (laughs) terrible name (laughs) <laughs> it's like a name you make up on the spot, you know. I mean, he is the ostensible big. Yeah, it is. It's just. It's like it's like uh, George Glass from uh, mm-hmm. from Brady Bunch. It's just or like, like uh, truck, uh, water, water, Casey, truck. Grasshopper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Casey Grasshopper. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, truck water is actually a good one. I should have tried that, Cassie Truck Water. <laughs> Cassie Truck Water. Well, you should sign up now. I mean, yeah. I don't know if they still exist. I don't I think know. they still. Probably exist. not if that's how they ran their business. No. <laughs> <laughs> so uh okay this this character is a mess of tropes honestly he's not a real character but i do really ap- appreciate how bad pike is at the i understand drugs portion of this book <laughs> mm-hmm. pretty smooth weed the fat guy said <laughs> it takes the edge off the ice the guy with the mustache agreed. Julia had read about ice. It was a powerful stimulant that was generally smoked. What the fuck is that? I mean, what what is that? But then uh, <laughs> his eyes, although filled with fury, nevertheless struck her as oddly blank. He's smoked too much ice. Mm. And then we do have one more. Crystal meth. Speed. Is it dangerous? She asked. Speed kills. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever used it once it was enough 
it's more addicting than crack. So there's our little oh. drug moment. Yeah. For just, for like, this book. Yeah. Got some dare talking points. Yeah, in totally, there. <laughs> totally. Just just read the dare handbook. Because uh-huh. like everything about that sounds like what the dare cop would tell us. They call it ice. <laughs> right. Which what's the thing they call it in uh, Riverdale? They call them jingle jangle the drugs. <laughs> <laughs> just like I mean, slightly more silly name as I Oh, how about how about Giggle Pig from uh, Brooklyn Nine Nine? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> no, but the best one there is Taxi because it's yellow and it gets you where you want to go. Mm. Yeah. So anyway, Frank Truckwater apparently was dating and in love with Julia's sister. Dun dun dun. <sighs> and then Julia's sister died because Frank was. Run off the road. Did they ever say who ran him off the road? No, he didn't get run off the road. He was drunk. and he Oh, he, so he was lying. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, they they spend way too much time with Frank at the end of this book, I feel like. The, the entire bad guy unravels because they're actually having a conversation with him. Um, yeah. Yeah. So he's not a good character. So I don't think we should spend too much time on him. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're going to spend even less time on Fat Kid. Oh, yeah. That one really bugged me. It's like every time they mention this kid, they have to use the word fat. Yeah. Like... And he was Fat Man, but then he was only 16, so he's Fat mm. Kid now. Once yeah. he got his knee blown off. Yeah. Once he got his. Yeah, I was thinking about you, Becca. <laughs> I was too, because they said his knee looked like hamburger. And yeah. I, like, oh, I bet Becca liked that. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about Ant Witch, another character that doesn't really get much characterization, except we're supposed to think she's the bad guy for a, a good portion of the book. Um, the ant was bone thin. The lines of her jaw moved visibly as she spoke. She was also incredibly pale and the hard wrinkles around her eyes looked as if they'd been carved. Her age was difficult to estimate. Amy would have said that she was close to 70, except for the energy that emanated from her. She approached Amy swiftly. Yeah, I wish she did more. You know? I do too. Like, like, what is up with you? Like, there there feels like... I mean, you know, for, for all my issues here, I, I did really enjoy this book. Mm-hmm. And I, I felt like there's there's a lot more to this idea... Uh, of the helpers and uh, like, like literally uh, her aunt is driving around like a, like a bunch of nuns from the seventies, you know, in their, in their, uh, um, what is, what are those long, uh, the habits? No, I like, mean the, the car, the, the oh, old oh. Long station <laughs> like wagon in the station wagon, you know, and just, just like roaming from town to town doing stuff, apparently helping people. But she wants to like, it's, it's a really interesting story that we don't get because Julia sacrifices her life to Scott. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when I was thinking about this, like, I feel like we have Frank and we have the aunt, but there really are no like satisfactory bad guys in this story, Right. which, which kind of like what you were saying, like my overall interpretation of what this book is doing, I like in a lot of ways. It's just that the characters are so thin and yeah. a lot of what I think is going to happen doesn't like I wanted to know, like, because they're setting up this dichotomy between Mother Florence and um, Aunt um Aunt Witch. She doesn't have a right name. There. I don't oh, think. She, okay, so I, I don't feel. So I bad. think it's <laughs> just literally Julia's aunt is is how she's referred to. I want, like, I want to know more because it also like implies this code of being a witch, which I find really fascinating. Yeah. And, like, what is the difference, and is this a coven, and why is Julia's mom not part of this coven? But we just we don't get any of it. I mean, the closest we get to a real character moment for the aunt is you stay out of this. The aunt told her, you're a caretaker of illness. You know nothing of healing. I did kind of like that line. I like yeah. that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And does she have some kind of mind control, too? Because well, yeah. She's her, like... her, uh, her purple eyes, the, uh, the uh, pupil swirls and, and convinces people to do things. And I want to see a lot of that. Like, Me I want to see some yeah. shit go down with her because she seems so really cool. It's very interesting. And, and yeah, it was totally blown because it was instead used as a, um, 
uh, MacGuffin, like a, mm-hmm. a twist that the ant was not actually a bad guy. That, so it's it's weird that we did that. Yeah, but, and there's also like a like she's the reason they have to get a hotel room, right? Because now she's following them. Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah. So they're just, afraid of her. Yeah, uh, but it's weird. She's, I don't know why. she's honestly like one of the coolest characters, and I really like. So I think it. I know we always joke about how we set up these like fan fiction stories, but like, wouldn't it be so cool if it was like, this was her like backstory of how like she lost her family members, her magical family, like her niece and her whatever. And then now she's going to go on and do some like really cool witchy stuff in another storyline that doesn't have super crappy oatmeal characters. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I would read the shit out of that. Yes, that sounds right? awesome. <laughs> yes. No, this is so another good. one in those lines of Christopher Pike books. It's like, really you sequelized those, but not this. Right. right. This is like the gunslinger and there's so much more yes. to this world. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's move into remember me, which is our plot discussion. Uh, before we get too deep into this, I really want to discuss the weird witchcraft plus Christianity we have here. Yes, that was, I have never encountered that um, Me kind neither. Of understanding of what witchcraft is, which, I mean, there are things about it that I like, and there are things about it that I really, really didn't like, but it just seems odd. It's, you know? It seems incorrect to me. And I mean, admittedly, I don't know a lot about uh, the legitimate witchcraft religions, you know, Wicca, but I do know enough that they do not believe in Christian God. Yeah. That it's, it's about uh, nature and that's, uh, you know, and, and I feel like it'd be a goddess if anything. Like yeah. Mm-hmm. Would repeatedly be saying, Oh God, like if I so, mean, maybe it's some other flavor of something that I don't know. It's, it's well, like I mean, made it, it, up. it specifically feels like Christopher Pike either didn't fully understand uh, witchy religions or was told by his publisher, if you have main characters that are witches, they better believe in God too. Mm, I wonder if it was another deity and he had to change it to God. It's very, I mean, it's very possible. Because that's kind of the whole thing is like, you don't have to be subservient to this Christian God or right. Judeo-Christian God, which was kind of the appeal to me. Now, the thing that I do like about this, and now if I'm thinking about it, maybe the publisher actually made him change, is um, I kind of like dabble in what I think of as my witch stuff because I'm mm-hmm. still kind of like I would call myself maybe a baby witch. Like I'm not um, really Aww, far enough. Witch. <laughs> I just don't like, I don't know. I feel like... <laughs> I haven't figured it all out yet, and I'm not really in a huge hurry to figure it out. But the thing that drew me to, like, kind of understanding what being a witch could mean is I was listening to a podcast about it, and somebody called in with a question and said, okay, so what book should I read if I want to be a witch? And the answer was there's really no one way to be a witch. Like, you can be a witch in a lot of different ways. And that's the thing that I really appreciated about this book is I think it is a different um, understanding of what being a witch means. It just doesn't feel feel like that's actually what a witch is like this feels like an empath she feels like kind of a healer which could be like things like that those could be like which i don't want to say powers but like part of being a witch but like she still feels very subservient to this this higher power which i mean part of my journey has been like i don't know if i want to get rid of my understanding of a higher power i just don't want to call it god anymore sure you know yeah so, well, sorry, I, think, I think that is really uh, I, like like the idea of them being helpers mm-hmm. and like being helpers to the point where helpers is capitalized. Because yeah, that and- feels very interesting to me. And I kept waiting for more of that, like because Amy kind of you get the feeling that she's kind of like adjacent to that and they kind of have some kind of connection but it just let's never really follow through on yeah it felt like she got a little something from mom i was waiting for that Mm -hmm. like when when uh when mother florence uh healed her migraines i think right Mm -hmm. which would be lovely let's all just say that oh i know (laughs) would be wonderful um i i was waiting for amy to show some sort of witchiness herself Mm-hmm. after that because i mean you know what that's the sequel that's yeah. which too 
Amy <laughs> uh, has has absorbed some of this. And sure, let's give some to Scott too. Yeah. Let's make them uh, a witch couple of helpers being uh, being mentored by Aunt Witch. Huh? I would watch that. Yeah. Slash okay. read that. <laughs> okay. Good. Cassie, write that down for our for our anthology, okay? You got it. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, it's it's just what I also think that really bugged me too is that there like her mother doesn't seem to be encouraging her to explore what being a witch means to her also. And it reminds yeah. me a lot of Firestarter in this way, which is okay. a book yeah. that I'm obsessed with recently. Um, in that, like, that they're making another movie of? I know, which, I mean, it's got Zac Efron in well, it, so uh, I'm going to watch it. <laughs> presumably, they're not going to have a, a Native American played by a George C. Scott. Yes, I think one. they have cast a Native American character. All which right. Is, uh, Progress. I mean, yeah, I mean, the character of Rainbird is still like hella problematic yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, totally. but i mean this is this is progress yeah but like the thing that i'm really drawn to about that book is it's like just this patriarchal method of containing this girl's power like she uh -huh. knows she has this power and they're teaching her to be afraid of it which is what mother florence does she's like okay you've no you've realized that you can do this thing you have this sight but only use it in this one way because it's dangerous to use it in this other way. Like she's never going to want to do that. It's never yeah. going to happen. So she's not preparing her at all for when this happens. And then it ends up killing her, you know? Well, it's, it's really uh, like I, what, what really sold me on this book is how balls out it goes. <laughs> yeah. It turns into die hard. Yeah. Because I've never had a Christopher Pike book do that before. Mm -hmm. Like to the point where where Amy suggests they should ram the the uh, gas station. I thought, yeah. are they actually going to fucking drive a car into the gas station? Because that's amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, like I I feel like so many uh, as as like horror movies and and this they don't go to the logical like this. Our life is insane at this moment, so let's be insane. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, the the best example and what re that moment made me think of is: uh, Have you seen uh, Lights Out? I have. Mm -hmm. okay. So you know when they're trapped in the house and they don't have any lights, but they're the boyfriend's outside with a fucking jeep <laughs> with a light panel on top of it. Why didn't he just literally drive through the front door? Right. I mean that. It, it's like you're you're being confronted with powers you can't possibly imagine. Why not meet them with strength? Right. Well, yeah. and I she's a witch. Like, she, can she do true. some yeah. witch stuff? You know. <laughs> <laughs> like, true. I thought she was gonna have. I guess I just always assume people are gonna somehow have pyrokinesis because maybe that's what I want. But like, when the first shots go off and shot, Scott Scott gets shot the first time, I thought she was gonna have some kind of like bullet killing powers or like yeah. the bullets were going to like bounce off of her or something because i mean the movie kind of turns into a little bit of an action you it know, really like, does i would have bought that yeah. but nope <laughs> no no <it's, laughs> i mean the that that said the sequence in the like it felt the most like some of Stephen King's action sequences mm -hmm. that I've ever gotten. Like the remember the the opening chapter of the Regulators. Uh -huh. It's like it's like seventy five pages over the course of a minute of plot time or something. Yeah, it's 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 so good when that when when you can sustain that as a writer, and Pike is really firing on all cylinders during that sequence until. He gets us talking with Frank Truckwater. And then it's yeah. just like, okay, well, you've uh you you've brought us right up to orgasm. <laughs> and now we're gonna go watch uh church. Yeah. All right, got back to the hospital. We we almost had a Frank gasm there. <laughs> <laughs> Which it's is, some serious literary edging, is what I'm saying. <laughs> well, and so we already shot this this kid too. Yeah, like yeah. he is like Frank for some reason, I, presumably because he's not overweight. Frank is deserving <laughs> of this kind of redemption, where this kid is just like she's like, oh, just let him bleed to death. He's yeah, fine. She literally blows the bottom of his leg off. I, yeah, I mean she doesn't kill him, so there's that. But you know, does he survive? 
He does, yeah, but he oh, never okay. walks right again, I think. <laughs> well, no shit. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> uh, so the let's let's talk a little bit about her, her witchy power. So um, we don't know if her mother could do this, but she looks in the pool behind the house and sees the future. And we also have this luminescent silver cord that stretches between uh, her her self self on in the human realm and her ethereal self, which is a really cool uh, personification of a, a theoretical thing, you know, of a, mm-hmm. an abstract concept. You know, it's not, it's not incredibly original, but it's well done. And mm-hmm. I think that's why I'm disappointed so much in some of the characters in this is because some of this plot stuff feels like among the best Pike has ever done. Some of the concepts here are very, very interesting. Mm-hmm. And he's sort of let down by himself in, in the, way, the way he develops the characters. It just never follows through on any of these ideas. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah, um, it's like the patriarchy had to come back in and like... <laughs> shut it down you know yes indeed because like if i'm looking at what her witch powers are and what her mother's witch powers are and i kind of mentioned empath before but like she is she is very insightful she's very empathetic Mm -hmm. and her mother kind of is a healer and she's a healer too and it's just like this this traditional female role of just taking all of this information and absorbing it until it ultimately kills her. And I think what I was frustrated about that, and I guess if I think about the Green Mile, like another problematic character, John Coffey, like he mm-hmm. absorbs all of this pain, but then he lets it out. And she never does that. She just absorbs, right. absorbs, absorbs, which is like, that's why you want to be a witch. So you stop having to do that stuff. You but know? I, I feel like that if she had just interacted with her aunt, mm-hmm. she may have learned how to defer it or... Uh, you know, somehow survive. Like I thought at the end, the twist was going to be the ant helps her save Scott. Mm-hmm. And without having to die, right? But just to arrive after it all, yeah. it's it's such a weird uh, plot contrivance there. Yeah, it's like she has to be a martyr for this thing that she can do. It's like it's too much for her to exist in this world, and so she'd yeah. rather just you know. And that is when we get the Christianity portion Mm -hmm. because it feels like that it's, 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 and you know, there's, there's conceptually the idea that so since she saved uh, Jim, she's upset the balance and Jim is going to die. And that's, that's great. That's like final destination. That's Mm -hmm. like back to the future. (laughs) Yeah. We've got conceptually the, he needs to die in order for, the balance to be restored. But, and I, and I do like that he is shot by the store clerk mm-hmm. because that's just a random that again, you know, we, we're comparing this a lot to King and obviously I think it's because we're fans of King, <laughs> but King loves to do that too. We're just randomly a stray bullet takes out a character mm-hmm. and it's the randomness that feels the realist too. And yeah. I, I really, oh, it, we're so close. I feel like this is so close to being a great book. It really is. And the way that I kind of see it is as it's kind of like an examination of grief and loss, yeah. you yeah. know, and like tragedy, like how you respond to tragedy. Because the other thing about her witch power, the reason that it makes her sick is when she like ha- when her ego is involved, which also mm-hmm. bugged me. I was like, no, it's okay for you to feel good about this really cool thing you can do. Um, <laughs> and so that was something I, I oh, Geez, I lost where I was going to go with it. But yeah, it's just, yeah, I lost my train of thought because I was so mad about the ego thing. Yeah, I know. It it completely (laughs) derailed you there. I know. (laughs) I need somebody to put their hands on the back of my neck and give me that. Yeah. The the healing power of massage. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I do like a good massage. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Especially after the pandemic. A nice nice touch would be great there. Um. So 
You know, it, it may be because I'm watching Archer a lot and they talk about how bad it is for you to be knocked out. But when she literally just whacks Jim with a gun, it's just like, okay, you know, you could kill him. Yeah. I mean, I, I get it. Too. This is this is what we did in writing in the 90s. I get it. Mm-hmm. But really, you could just, you could have uh, caused a brain hemorrhage. And wouldn't you feel terrible at that mm-hmm. point? Yeah. <laughs> Jim just never wakes up. (laughs) Boy, that would have been, that would have been a twist. (laughs) I know. I could have seen it happening (laughs) in this book. Yeah. She, um, like, you know, those episodes of like Frasier or something where it's like this, this whole plot could be resolved with like a five minute conversation. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. This is, it's one of those for sure. Yeah. And I mean, I, I get that there are real reasons that lots of times people don't have those conversations. And that's kind of what maybe this is where I was going a minute ago. Like, I like seeing her kind of struggling with this guilt and this grief that she has. And it feels yeah. like a lot of like, because she starts to have this rage. Um, and I was like, oh, you know what, Julia, those are feelings. Those are feelings yeah. that you have not been allowing yourself to have because you have this like, perfect helper, like, role that you think you're supposed to play and that's not like being being a witch can be again that's a great thing for the aunt to come in and work through with her yeah there's a balance here we can find this balance together because there there needs to be that idea that there is also value in rage there's value Mm -hmm. in both sides of your personality Mm -hmm. and we don't get that unfortunately yeah um I really, you know, as much as I don't like Julia sacrificing herself for Scott, I love the idea that she has to do it horribly (laughs) by drowning herself in the ice water. Yeah. Like that is really upsetting and visceral. And I I think there's, there's something really, I don't, I mean, magical is not the right word, but there is something really impressive about that well and it's like seeing as how the pond is like the source of her power too there's this kind of like this power is consuming her which kind of feels like a betrayal you know and yeah because i mean i don't know would you rather drown in the the ice water or the lava water like the boiling well water. the lava water has freddy krueger in it so <laughs> so no thank you <laughs> the man with the the razors for fingernails <laughs> well, uh-huh. okay <laughs> <laughs> um i want to call out uh, a weird moment the reading of julia's will three days after her, she, her death <laughs> she uh left the house and surrounding property to amy and scott okay so let's follow this train of thought <laughs> i was thinking that Julia did not know she was going to die, number one, until she sacrificed herself to save Scott. Right? Mm Mm-hmm. So, therefore, (laughs) she would have had to find a notary, write up a will, have it notarized, deliver it to the proper places, and then sacrifice herself to save Scott. (laughs) Unless... She just randomly decided to to give her property to Amy and Scott before. Yeah, I think she just did it after her mom died. I feel like that's a reason. Really? Thing. Yeah, like when when my little brother died, my mom like got super. She like started doing a will, and she was like, "You kids, you need to have a will for all your stuff." And we were really uh-huh. young, so we were like, and she ended up having to go to therapy about that. But um, sure. I mean, not that specifically, but just the whole thing, and we. The kids didn't have to write wills anyway. But... <laughs> did she? I was going to say, did <laughs> yeah, she make no. you write a no, will? Or... No, she she did though. And okay. so I feel like the will thing is because when somebody dies in your life, um, if they haven't written one, especially because it was yeah. unexpected, like as I'm assuming her mom was, like she probably just inherited all that stuff. Like there wasn't even maybe necessarily anything that gave it to her. So I feel like that was a reasonable thing after her mom died since it had been so recent that she mm-hmm. probably did that. Plus, if those are her only like two friends she grew up with them she doesn't really have other family she doesn't know her dad so well, that's that that's normal. another interesting thing though legally wouldn't she uh find out about her dad when her mom died yes because legally if he, not if he gave up or if he gave up rights to her or signed any sort of abandonment papers then no hmm. oh okay what surprised me is it feels like this town has like 15 people in it <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that like these two people around the same age with the same last name, like it just 
strikes me as odd that they never would have come into Well, they lived on the all. rich side of town, it, it oh, seems like. Oh, yeah. Because he lives in mean- like a, a big fancy house. <laughs> Probably with a four-car garage. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> and one of those garage doors has a boat in it. You know it. Yeah, for the pond. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe that's why they got separated as he kept riding his boat in the pond. like. <laughs> Water skiing on her sacred right. pond. She's like, stop, I'm trying to have visions. <laughs> uh, before we wrap up the plot discussion, I do want to call out the dream sequences in this book. I am a sucker for a good dream sequence. And Pike uh, always writes interesting dreams. But I really, I, I really identified the vision of the black wave on the horizon Mm, mm -hmm. i've had that dream Mm. and i know other people have had that dream the wave on the horizon and i find that very interesting and i live i live in chicago so it's not like there will ever be a wave on the horizon (laughs) um but yeah it's it's cool and the the tahiti dreams that seem to take place outside the world I was surprised it wasn't uh, Hawaii, though, honestly. Yeah. Aren't they naked in one of them? They are. It's they like, are skinny dipping. That's interesting. I, I mean, I guess like, I, I don't know. That just seems she, like an odd thing for somebody who's not into Scott, too, you know? Well, I don't, I don't know if she's not into Scott. It sort of feels like she kind of is. But she's at the same time that girl who gets literally anyone she wants. So mm, maybe she's mm-hmm. not. Yeah, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. The dream sequences, like when I think back about the books that I have not revisited that I remember reading, the dream sequences stand out a lot to me as memorable. But they seem a lot of times to kind of serve as a fake out, you know, like. Yeah, very true. Yeah, especially in the books that kind of function more as like slasher stories, you know, Um, and these were, I guess this book is not like that. Like this book doesn't, that's not how the plot unfolds, but these were very like creative. They're more creative and like otherworldly than I remember a lot of the dream sequences. Like when she's hanging out with her mom, it it again felt like, I know we've we've referenced the, uh, the episode of Buffy um, Restless in the Mm -hmm. past and it it has that sort of disjointed feel to it Mm -hmm. you know like we're we're getting symbols we're not getting scenes and i think the best dream sequences are that where it's it's everything is a symbol because that's what dreams are Mm -hmm. and so few filmmakers and so few writers really embrace the chaos of dreaming and, and another uh, one is um, Nightmare on Elm Street, which is, yeah. you know, interesting that he pops up. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just. funny. Like, this is just such a mature story mm-hmm. framed in this, like, kind of bubblegum kind of shell, you know? And I think that's why it's kind of unsatisfying in a lot of ways. It's just like these are bigger themes and bigger ideas and bigger struggles than we really can fit into this structure, you know? And it, it makes me wonder, you know, cause he was writing his adult books alongside this and he obviously did not write nearly as many adult books as he did, um, teen books. But I wonder sometimes if like, like this feels like with another year of development, this could be an adult book. Mm-hmm, totally. You know? And so I wonder if he, if he sometimes, sort of um, crams his ideas into the category of teen because he has to meet a deadline. Yeah. And he doesn't have the time to develop it. But I really wish he had because this one, there's depth here that is not touched. Yeah. Yeah. The last 20 20 to 40 pages or so, I'm like, oh, that's how this is ending? Yeah. Like, really? Wait, wait, what? Right. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and when we come back, we're going to dive into some quotes from the book. We'll be right back on the Pikecast. Wow, 
friends, where else can you get this kind of programming than the Pikecast? Nowhere, that's where. But we're trying to keep the lights on here. If you like what you're hearing and want it to keep happening, jump over to our Patreon at thepikecast.com slash Patreon and throw us a few bucks to join our private Discord server. Higher tiers get books, stickers, bookmarks, and even personalized shirts. That's thepikecast.com slash Patreon. Once, Osgood and Frost were the up-and-coming stars of the burgeoning paranormal investigation TV show craze before a hoax put an end to their friendship, partnership, and television careers. Now, over a decade later, Prudence Osgood is a barely functioning alcoholic ghost hunter for hire. Her yearning for mystery and adventure is reignited when she receives a cryptic, untraceable email. She can't resist embarking on an investigation that tugs threads, winding through a sinister series of disappearances, her former partner's family, and a night 20 years ago when a semi blew a yellow light and nearly killed her. Reviewers are calling As Good As Gone a masterfully vulnerable and relatable 21st century horror story and a bourbon-soaked supernatural mystery with sparkling dialogue that sticks the landing on LGBT characters and main character Prudence Osgood, as tortured as she is clever, broken in all the best ways, and a true heroine for our times. Buy it today at As Good As Gone as a paperback, ebook, or audiobook narrated by me, J.J. Ronvier. Welcome back to the Pikecast. Now we're moving into the Eternal Enemy, the section where we talk about our antagonist. Uh, does anyone even really think we have an antagonist in this book? No. <laughs> no. I, uh, yeah, it's it's sort of like the, the universal death is the antagonist. Yeah, uh, which I kind of like. You yeah, know, no, true. But and you don't need an antagonist. <laughs> but right. the ones we we've set up to be the antagonist, like like Frank, uh, who's definitely Julia's antagonist, and Aunt Witch, who is Amy's antagonist, and then Randy, who's everyone's antagonist. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Randy might help deliver that baby. You don't know. <laughs> you true. don't know. I'm really he could go that. in there and just be, he could discover a preternatural ability to deliver babies. Oh, God. And then they'd that's be like. The sequel. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's sequel. Randy's, Randy's baby delivery service. He's, he becomes a midwife. Yeah. Aw. I know it's sweet. it's With sweet. all of his tree skills, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we did, we didn't really <laughs> dig into that with Randy. Is that he is a gifted artist who literally is just carving trees in the woods behind? Uh, uh, I forgot her name because she's Julia Julia's house. <laughs> Yeah, Does and that... it's kind of like how Scott has like this sensitive filmmaker side to him, yeah. but also he's kind of a dick in all the other parts of his life. It's like these things. And I mean, I guess those two things often can be true at the same very time. Very true. Yeah, very true. But it's just, I don't know. It feels like, I don't Well, know. I mean, I've, I've noticed this about the characters that feel like Pike um, writing himself into the story. Mm-hmm. Is he tends to either glorify like he did in master of murder or make himself the butt of the books joke. Mm. And the butt of the books joke is these two guys, Scott and Randy, who are seemingly nice guys who cover it up with uh, an endless string of, sex jokes, um, misogyny, because of what it seems like that's what's expected of them. Mm-hmm. And so I wonder if that's what Pike is doing with these characters, is they have to not be likable by the main character. Because if they were, there's a chance 
the main character would have just dated them. And then Jim wouldn't have been involved in the first place. Yeah, and it would feel like there's no real conflict either. Because yeah, that's like true. We, yeah, we've been talking about like there's no there's no real bad guy, and I think maybe you know to pull out my soapbox like the, the bad <laughs> hey, you guy. You pull maybe, that out. <laughs> the bad guy maybe is the patriarchy that tells uh-huh. Julia what she's supposed to be and kind of control. Like she's internalized the system of control, and the bad it's this. Um, this is what Randy's supposed to be, and this is what Scott's right. supposed to be, and it doesn't matter like that this poor woman has one night off a week at the cafe, like he's gotta get laid. <laughs> yeah, so right. like oh, let's let's woman. go to I know that 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 part really was shocking to me because it felt like something I don't think anybody would write. They were today. taking advantage of someone for no reason. Right. And going out of their way. Okay, and so the characters are calling her dumb. And the book itself is calling her dumb also, because how on earth do you not realize, like, yes, he's tall, but like you're going to a high school football game. All of his friends are high school students. Yeah. Like, that, how that's do you not, not how it works. This? Yeah. Exactly. It's just very, very unbelievable. And that she was going to cook dinner for Randy the next night, too. I mean, she read to me as kind of an alcoholic, and I'm not sure if they yeah. said that. Yeah, I, I, I got that vibe, too. Yeah. Which doesn't help the characterization but but at the same time she read as like a mid-40s alcoholic Mm -hmm. not a 30 year old waitress right because the 30 year old waitress is going to be a little more savvy i feel like yeah because she probably sees little dipshits like scott and randy all the time come in yeah 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 it's weird so we're just going to agree that they're – I mean, I, I like the patriarchy being the <laughs> eternal enemy. Uh, He's kind in, of always the eternal enemy. In, in which case, I could probably take it and say God is the enemy. I mean, yeah, I would go with you on that too. Yeah. <laughs> you want me to get my other soapbox out? <laughs> yeah, pull it out. Pull it out. <laughs> <laughs> but it is it is very interesting. Like when you mentioned the, the, all the rules of the the witchcraft stuff because that does feel – like artificial limiting of female empowerment. Mm -hmm. And I had not considered it that way. Obviously I'm not female. So (laughs) I, I often miss little things like that, but that is a, and, and that totally jibes with the Catholic church's historical bias against powerful women in the faith. Mm hmm. So, nope. yeah, they're witches. Yeah. Yeah. And there's this kind of understanding of because, like I said earlier, like there is no one way to be a witch and a witch is not one thing only. Right. But there's this understanding of um, witches as serving Satan or serving like Lucifer right, right. or the devil, you know. Um, but I have never seen a witch calling themselves a witch and serving God. It just kind of seems like it. It defeats the purpose. And if I think about what makes me so mad about how this book plays out, it's that she has to sacrifice herself for just kind of existing as she is, which yeah. feels like a, a re- feels like the reason that I wanted to investigate witchcraft in the first place. You know, I wanted to get away from that. I didn't right, want that yeah. anymore, you know? And that's the problem with tying it to God right there. Right, exactly. Yeah. Speaking of God, I do have a, a line <laughs> that I really enjoyed. Uh, Randy is thinking about this. He bet they killed little puppies and burned Bibles. Randy had never read the Bible himself, but he did like dogs. I highlighted that line too. It's like that line is is basically I'm here to chew bubble gum and kick ass. <laughs> yep. <laughs> like I'm I'm here to to read the Bible and like dogs, and I'm all out of the Bible. <laughs> I mean, it does sound like something Randy would say. <laughs> yeah, <you know? laughs> totally, totally. I really enjoyed that. Uh, let's move on to Thirst, our section about titillation and sexuality in Pike's world. We have all we have already covered the romantic thirst, which is just obnoxious between uh, Jim and Julia throughout this book. Poor Amy's pining thirst. Um, but yes, I, I fully have now headcanoned Amy is being into Julia, the whole thing, Mm -hmm. fully. So I've got some quotes for the thirst section. This is not a very sexy book, but does anyone have any before I I go with that? I have one. I don't have any. You have one? All right. right. What do you got? 
Um, it's kind of fucked up in a way, but I'm going for it anyway. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> I didn't want to depress her. You can't undress a woman who's depressed. Mm, I remember wow. that line. That is fucked up. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it was kind of like, I don't know. I know you guys don't like Randy very much, but I do feel like he was full of some one-liners. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Both, both uh, I, I, as I was reading the Randy, it's like, you know, I like him more and more. He is obnoxious <laughs> and he is so inappropriate. But I'm really enjoying his energy. <laughs> Can I just say while I was reading that line, though, I legit thought, like, I feel like this is one of the things that Christopher Pike thought about more than actually lived because actually that's very easy to do and that's like a whole stereotype that like yeah when a woman is depressed and upset like she'll do like whatever and be like yeah super into it Mm -hmm. i've dated some guys gone on some dates that i would not have gone on otherwise just because i was like feeling very bad about myself with people who did like who treated me poorly so like I, I read that and I was like, mm, that's not as difficult as you think, little boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, maybe that says something about our author, that he's a real nice guy and not a nice guy, nice guy. Mm. Yeah. So maybe he was saying it like, you can't do this because it's not yeah. right and not like this is hard to do because that. Right. right. I feel like yeah. most of my sex life is due to depression. So <laughs> yeah, I was like, dude, this is not how. I would like if this is if you don't get undressed when you're depressed, I would always be clothed. Like, <laughs> all right, that's all from me. <laughs> well, well, uh, the sexy bummer cast here. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. No, don't don't be sorry. That's my specialty. (laughs) You don't have a podcast full of queer people without depression. (laughs) Yeah. It's just not a thing. You you have them both. Okay, so I have... (laughs) She's not the smartest woman in the world, but she has a deep appreciation of nature, of all natural activities. I think she might be the one, Amy. I think this is it. This is about... Poor Sally. Amy took the statement to mean that Scott had finally found a woman who would go to bed with him. (sighs) Poor Sally. Yeah, Scott. Yeah. There's just so much I want to talk to him about. (laughs) (laughs) This one's interesting. This is after the, uh, remember the line, uh, surprised if he excelled at wrestling this year? This immediately follows that. He had made it clear he found her physically stimulating. Without slapping him, she had made it clear that she wasn't there to stimulate him. I no? mean, I guess it's good that she set some boundaries. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it just felt so illicit, that line. Right. Okay. And so what's interesting about this book is because I I enjoy the amount of like friendship love I feel like there is, Mm -hmm. you know, or Mm -hmm. like platonic love. But it's like there's no concept of actual romantic love in this book unless I mean, you're reading because I I do quite like the idea that Amy is in love with Julia. It's like this is all just infatuation and horniness, you know, or weird witch trans uh love (laughs) right like intoxicating love yeah yeah because honestly if the only reason jim is interested in julia is because of witch trans that's what gets him killed Mm, mm -hmm. and maybe she should have thought of that yeah or maybe the women in her life should have guided her through well yeah no that that's also that's also very true maybe maybe aunt witch shouldn't have spent all her time just being grumpy old aunt and actually you know helped her there's a moment at the beginning that I was like, I don't know if I like Julia, where she's like, yeah, she just kind of got tired of people falling in love with her all the time. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Like, uh. That felt like that felt like uh, Pike's normal lines reserved for the vapid cheerleaders in his book. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, it's just another boy falling in love with me. <laughs> I'm so, so bored. <laughs> I did like the section where she's playing with Jim's hair. Like, I just liked <laughs> that paragraph, just the way he was writing it. And I wish I had it marked, but I forgot. Um, but That's I when actually they're in read... the hotel, right? Yeah. It's yeah. just like I got kind of a little ASMR reaction from it. Cause it's just, <laughs> it, was, it was lovely writing. I, I enjoyed it. I also, I really, really, really would like to have a massage from Julia. Just yes, saying. I know, mm-hmm. right? Get rid of, get rid of migraines. Probably get yeah. rid of... Uh, of other bodily uh, chronic pain, it'd be great. It'd be yeah, great. I would love it. So I, I've got two more from the third. 
again, this is not a sexy book. So I had to really <laughs> scrape the barrel here. It's a secret treasure. Should I get it for you? She smiled. Sure. Scott dived beneath the surface, his feet kicking in the air. A moment later, Julia let out a squeal. He had pinched her bare butt. <laughs> Exclamation point. <laughs> Yeah, you like that? So sexy. Oh, yeah. Your delivery is nice, too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I, I've i perfected it over the, the 20-some episodes here. Um, and then there's the, this last one, which, again, not sexy, scraping the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> hey, what do you think of all the tubes they got running into me? You know, they even got one for me to pee in. I saw this real cute nurse changing my bottle. She was blonde. I wonder what she thought of my... M dash. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh. <laughs> Just a groan. Just I mean, a groan. Yeah, I mean, is he talking about like changing his like the Yeah, I hope she liked like, my cock while she was changing yeah. my catheter. A catheter, that's the word yeah. I'm looking for. Yeah. Ooh. I mean, I, I doubt there is anything less sexy that can be I mean I'm sure there is, but let's let's be frank here. There's very little less sexy than uh Sliding a tube for pee up your urethra. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there are people that are into that. But yeah, and, and it's just somebody, true. Yeah. I don't want to shame the sounding community here. I want to be clear. <laughs> well, and there's also like the thought of like someone else handling it. Like it's kind of a demeaning thing yeah, because yeah. she's not just handling the catheter, assuming she's also kind of emptying the bag. Yeah, too, yeah that's you true. Know. She's also a professional medical uh, personnel. Right, giving yeah. him care. <laughs> so she's probably not like, oh, look at this uh, 17-year-old boy's penis. <laughs> look at this M-dash. I'm going to start calling it M-dash. <laughs> <laughs> well, M-dash is a great, uh, a great description for a penis. <laughs> because it, it's sometimes small, but when you add another one, they combine. You know? Yeah, I mean, you could have an N-dash or an M-dash. Yeah. Know? Sorry, I'm... <laughs> Maybe pulling it's, this thread more. You know, no, you know what? You know what? There is nothing better than grammar humor. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move into Die Softly, where we talk about moralizing and problematic elements in the writing and plot. I really, really do believe now that a lot of the God stuff was moralizing stuff. And I feel like that was laid into him by publishers. Because later works, especially his, his um, stories that involve uh, the Hinduism, there there's little of that um, oppressive Christian God. So it's not like he only wants to write that story. And, and again, it just surprised me that he wrote the oppressive Christian God into his witchcraft story. Yeah, that was the biggest problematic element for me is to give all of the and then just go on to describe something that's not even really Christianity because that's right, not, totally, like totally. it's it's like it doesn't fit either side, you know. It's I, again, wonder... <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of Pike that does this where he heard about a concept and then just invented what it is. Yeah, and that's kind of the uh, the understanding I get, and I feel like what this was written probably in the early 90s i'm not well exactly this came sure. out in 90 so he was probably writing this in 89 and i just understand like i mean i'm kind of glad he didn't say wicca you know because yeah. i feel like that would have been the easy thing to do and i wonder if maybe he did and this was the way well yeah that's that's what i think it. may because i know that my knowledge of wicca came in the mid 90s mm -hmm. And yeah. so it is It is definitely possible, and especially if you, like, we're going to go afield here, but if you look at, like, the West Memphis Three, mm -hmm. uh, they were talking about Wicca and witchcraft, and that was 92, 93, I think, uh, or, or early 90s, and it was the most uh, scandalous, Satan-worshipping thing. So it is very possible that a, um, a publisher would not want a positive portrayal of the Wiccan religion. Yeah. And I feel like there's a lot more understanding of what 
being a witch is or identifying as a witch now is now than mm-hmm. there was mm-hmm. back then. And it's still, I, I feel like it's very like demonizing. Like I live in the Bible belt and like if I were, if I talked about some of this stuff at work, I would still be afraid that I might get fired. But it still is like, it's much more understood and accepted. Sure, um, yeah. But this is coming like back in the late 80s, like it it's been really dangerous for women to talk about this for a long time and it does just feel like this thing because part of it feels very progressive like Mm -hmm. he's wanting to say like that she is a human being like she wants to help people she's not bad like the only time she's vilified is when she wants to kill people who shot her friend you know right um but it's just like there there's no real understanding of what what it is he's actually writing about and i kind of wish he had just like maybe she was just a character who's struggling with these things you yeah. know instead of trying to kind of shoehorn it into witches because if he's going to do that i want him to go all the way and show me some some cool witches and some good witches and some bad witches and you know and he even does mention that it is specifically a female empowerment trait because it is only the women in the bloodline that mm-hmm. have it pass between them mm-hmm Okay, I have one more problematic line, and it's really the most problematic thing in the book, and it's not so bad. But maybe we can pick up a couple of six-packs and get the girls drunk and take advantage of them. Hmm. It's a Scott line. Yeah. Oh, Scott, who's, like, so lovely and just happy all the time and then just says this really fucked up shit. Yeah, yeah, right. Like, that's just it. But again, I feel like that, that does feel kind of like 90s to me, you know? Oh, yeah, 80s, totally, 90s. totally. He's uh, he's the uh, Sean William Scott character. Yeah, it's oh. one of those things where, like, I I kind of... I can't give the book too much shit. Like I got to kind of give grace for the understanding of where we were as a culture Mm -hmm. back then. But I think it's interesting to like revisit this stuff and call it out because I feel like this, this kind of it's pervasive throughout the book because it was pervasive throughout our culture. When there's definitely a lot of Pike books that have far more pervasive uh, rape culture and abuse mm. and uh, I mean we're not even getting into the problematic cultural appropriation but mm-hmm. um, there definitely is, this is this is one of the milder cases because Scott and Randy while they are these boorish characters they ultimately don't seem like they would actually do any of the things they're saying and that's why I I really enjoy talking about books like this where it's not really over the top. It's not really in your face. And you kind of look at like Randy and Scott probably feel like some high school kids now, you know. Mm-hmm. And so we can say, OK, this is why saying that thing is not OK, even right, though right. we know you're not going to do it. And th- so that's how like. That's why we keep having these conversations, why I think it's important to keep talking about it, even though we're kind of understanding, well, we wouldn't, he wouldn't have written this today, right. but why wouldn't he have written this today? You know? And that is that, yeah, that is the rape culture discussion. That is, mm-hmm. the, that's what made that acceptable. And that's what made that something that was not just acceptable, but something that you could easily joke at and it would just be considered a little, oh, can you, you know, punch you on the arm. Come on. Right. Don't. Yeah. And it's not the fact that it was okay back then and it is not okay anymore. It's that the people who found it not okay back then didn't have the power to say, this yeah. makes me feel uncomfortable, you know? And so now, even in a, a book that's supposedly about a lot of female empowerment, they don't even really think about it, you know? Because right. they kind all. of internalized it. Because, you know? And with the pervasiveness of it, too. Mm-hmm. Because, like, Randy is just hitting on Amy the entire time they're trying to save multiple friends who are dying right it's, yeah he does feel like sean williams Scott. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay we'll move into the season of passage where we discuss the best and worst writing the weird stuff and the pikeisms i'm gonna take us into the pikeisms first ladies i am proud to say we have another reference to someone reading an adult magazine <laughs> This time it's Playboy, though. Mm. So that person is reading uh, some actual quality content. And it happens to also be at a gas station like the last one. <laughs> really, that's that's what his gas station attendants do <laughs> in, in Pike's world, is just read the adult magazines. 
which I assume is why they're encased in plastic these days. <laughs> I didn't it, know that Stephen King's stories were like originally some of them published in Penthouse and stuff. So oh, like yeah. I found that out and I was like, oh, I know what Penthouse is because yeah. of our, but that other episode where <laughs> you explained it. <laughs> yeah, he ha- he published a lot in Cavalier too, which I think is a men's mm-hmm. magazine. And apparently there is a like one of the best interviews he's ever given. Stephen King was for Playboy. Oh, without question. Yeah, that interview was amazing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it that's the thing about Playboy is it becomes the butt of the joke when you say you read it for the articles, but the articles are honestly some of the best writing because they're not constrained Mm -hmm. by typical publishing standards which means the the interviews can be candid and revealing Mm -hmm. you know the articles can be hard-hitting like over the last uh over the last five years with uh trump there have been some really great bits of journalism in playboy that a lot of newspapers wouldn't print Mm mm-hmm so yeah, it's so hey, this gas station attendant has chosen wisely. <laughs> um we've got the absentee parent. Uh, dad uh, left when he was very young. We've got the recent death with mother dying. We've got the dedication for Anne which uh, is Pike's sister, Jen. I don't know if you know. Oh, that. oh no, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. A lot of his early books are dedicated to Anne. Oh. Um and we've got this. This has become a trope that's just getting more obnoxious every time it shows up. The uh, best friend that just randomly steals the best friend's boyfriend. Yeah, it just keeps coming up, and it gets annoying every time. Oh, I forgot in the problematic section. The town's name is fucking Indian Pole. Yeah, yeah. That's- Not even Totem Pole. Yeah, Indian make, pole. Make it extra problematic. Like, I don't... <laughs> some of his town names are terrible in general. <laughs> but that, that feels, like, aggressively bad. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not even a good town name. No, it's you know? not. Indian like, pole. I mean, I, mean, I guess their mascot is probably a, an offensive Native American stereotype. Oh, of course, of But course. it could easily be just a pole, you know? Yeah. Like well, I mean, poles. that's not a great mascot. Exactly, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's it's just an odd choice. It's it's like truck water, you know. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It, it's one of those things where where he's looking around, uh, Indian <laughs> pole. Right. Or, yeah. Or he forgot what a totem pole is. <laughs> and yes, oh, one of those uh, Indian poles. Yeah. yeah. Just yeah. on his way out to the publisher. He's like, <laughs> yes. Exactly. Oh find- shit! I have a placeholder here. <laughs> right. Command find. Just type it yeah. in. Or they yeah. call him up. It's like, you know, you didn't name the town, right? <laughs> yeah, Indian Paul. Are yeah. you serious? Do you really want to go with that? Like, I mean, okay, I'll go with it. that. But really? <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so I've got I've got some good writing and I've got some weird writing and I've got some gory writing just for Becca. So uh, does anyone else have quotes that they'd like to share before I go into that? I don't. Okay. I found Let's, something that I quite liked. Yes, um, please. I it's at the very end when they're walking out to the lake, and I just thought it was a really sweet. Um, the morning was cold; frost clung to the trees like blankets of white winter, although fall had scarcely begun. And that mm. is a little bit of that kind of like nostalgic kind yeah. of reminding me of like my like the bookmobile was coming around, like it was kind of fall was closing yeah. in, you know. So I liked that line. I like that a lot. That was about my only good thing that I found. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, I've got a few. Uh, she uh, she was afraid to see other people to let the hurt go. She was afraid that if she did, the memories of her mother would also go. They would fade and become like ash, like the ash of her mother's remains to be lost on the wind. Hmm. I like that. Yeah, that's nice. And there Julia was, bent over and sobbing at the edge of the pond. The ends of her fine red hair dipped in the cold, clear water like trails of blood. Mm-hmm. I like that. Love that. Yeah. No. And then the experiences were all one, not separate from one another. They were interwoven like the threads of a tapestry. Mm. Not bad. I like that. Let's go to weird. <laughs> we got to get that bread to pay King. 
If you think you feel bad now, think about what King could do to you. Uh, Pike's gang leaders are so... <laughs> Yeah. So ineffectual and not scary. Last one, it was Duke. Yeah, it's like, hello, fellow young people. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, she pumped her shotgun again and called out, You have a wounded man out here, Frank. What do you say I don't plaster his brains on the wall if you come out with your hands up and your gun in your teeth? <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> So not, I mean, we have, we, Seems like really we totally have John McClane moment there. Right. That's just derailed by, wait, gun and teeth? Like, I, I, you expect Frank to call back? How would that even work? Yeah. That's a very, like, this is going to sound real tough. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Becca, are you ready? I've got yes. gore for you. Can't wait. It could have been a monster. Scott's flesh was bloody as if a dozen razors had sliced him from head to foot. His blood soaked into the frothy water as the bubbles grew in size and number around his flailing limbs. I can't believe I missed that somehow. It, I mean, a lot, of the, a lot of the gore was in that dream sequence. Mm, true. Help me, Scott pleaded, his right shoulder open, the bleeding muscle care, clearly visible. Ah. And then here's where Freddy <laughs> shows up. A hand with knives for nails reached up from the bubbling cauldron and caught hold of his forehead. But pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> and then the best. The fat kid's right knee exploded in a shower of red. Mm. And then in italics, one word sentences, gross, sick, <laughs> yuck. <laughs> And that is a very Stephen King thing to do. Totally. Like he does a lot of little totally. Italian inserts, you know. I think it works a little bit better when he does <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Most of the time. But uh, but I feel like I I feel like I see where Pike was going here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, is what is what uh, yeah, it's It's very it's, visceral. It is. Yeah. And there are some real moments of of cool gore in, in here. Mhm. Mm and like she blew off a uh, part of Frank's hand in their standoff. Like that whole action sequence is really just uh, so, uh, some of the most exciting Pike I've ever read. I think mm -hmm. it's very action oriented. It really is. Yeah, I found a weird thing, and it's not anything to do with the writing. But when um, they're talking about the people that he's selling drugs to, the name um, Robert Rutherford is the name of my high school boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I, I was like, oh, my God, because it's spelled exactly the same, too. <laughs> wow. Holy shit. That's weird. All right. Uh, that's, you know. That's, <laughs> so that's maybe a little It's like a direct call out to your high school boyfriend. I know. <laughs> like, you don't maybe, expect that, really. You don't I expect that. I am a witch. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That brings us to the last act where we give our final thoughts and ratings out of five pikes. And Jen, since you are our guest, you get to go first. Um, I hmm, I really wanted to like to like this book. I was really, really on board for a lot of it. I feel like kind of what we've talked about, there's a lot of depth here. I just feel like it was not really executed at all. Mm -hmm. um, and it really kind of left me wanting a lot more, but also kind of annoyed me in the way that it was resolved. So I think I'm kind of, I'm going to split the difference and go two and a half pikes. Two and a half pikes. Okay. Becca, where are yes. you at? Um, I'm going to agree with Jen and throw it smack dab in the middle with 2.5 <laughs> Cassie grasshoppers. <laughs> <I love it. laughs> wow. I don't know. Uh, if we put that out there, Becca, Columbia House may find Cassie. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> And that, and yeah, then she's gonna she's gonna be arrested. It's gonna be a whole big thing. A whole big thing. <laughs> oh, I'll get you out. <laughs> okay, you're yeah, gonna bust her out. Yeah, we'll do a prison, prison break. break. Yeah, Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. we're gonna need to put together a crew. Yes, <laughs> all bugs. Becca's gonna get a full body tattoo of the prison layout. <laughs> <laughs> they, they would never see us coming. <laughs> Okay, Cassie, where are you at? Um, okay. 
Um, I think this is going to be my lowest rating. So wow. this is one that I've read before. I've actually, I think I read it like twice when I was younger and I did not like it then. Okay. Which was very surprising to me because I like the concept of like the witch thing. So I was really always, I'm always so excited for this book before I actually read it. And then I read it and I'm so disappointed. <laughs> there are too many guns. There are too many boring misogynistic white men. There are too <laughs> many, not enough Freddy Krueger dream sequences. <laughs> and so... <laughs> Uh, I'm going to give it one and a half pikes with a hamburger knee <laughs> to oh, get it wow. up. So it's almost two, but not quite because it's, you know, quite pulpy and hamburger My, my. Um, yeah, I, I just, I really, I like a lot of the ideas, but I don't think they were executed well. And I think that <clears throat> because they weren't done well and because the characters were just so not great, it just really pulled away from how good it could have been. Um, mm-hmm. So I wish I wish there was another witchy book that was actually witchy stuff. <laughs> but yeah, this wasn't it for me. I feel like this is the first time I did something higher than you. I think so too. Yeah, I'm usually I usually am so like there's so much nostalgia for me. But this one, I, when I was younger, I didn't know why I didn't like it. And now that I'm older and can articulate that I do not like these bland oatmeal white men <laughs> getting everything given up for them so that they can live their mediocre lives, I just. I'm not here for that. And I hate it. I hate it so much. So this one just didn't do it for me. Wow. This is going to be a unique one for me too, because I, I very, very rarely give higher ratings than the two of you. <laughs> I'm going to give it three and a half. Nice. For the action sequence alone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because it really reminded me about halfway through 28 days later when it suddenly just turns into Die Hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's like, whoa, where did this come from? <laughs> and I, I really, really dug that. And I wish they had been able, I wish he had been able to sustain the momentum uh, because it is messy and it's messy in all the traditional Pike ways mm-hmm. uh, with too many characters and redundancy. And, and that's, that's just par for the course with a lot of these Pike books, but there are pieces that really, um, really stood out for me. And uh, I feel like I have to reward those when they come up. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm going to go with 3.5. Okay, so Jen, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, this of has course, been a this delight so to talk fun. to you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, will you tell our listeners where they can find more of you and where they can find your podcasts? <laughs> well, you can find me lots of places. You can find me um, at Jen Ferratu on Twin. Uh, I almost said Twister on Twitter and Instagram. <laughs> Hopefully, not playing Twister anytime soon. Um, and that's Jen with two N's. And you can find me co-hosting the Losers Club podcast, which is all about Stephen King. Um, and you can also find me on Psychoanalysis, which is about mental health and horror. And I am in the middle of a limited series podcast now called uh, White Ladies in Crisis, and we are reviewing the physical um, Apple TV show with Rose Byrne and Jazzercise, oh. and it is just delightful. And that's on the Anatomy of a Screen Pod Squad, and we're about, uh, I think, four episodes in at this point. Nice. So it's pretty new. And you can find you can find my writing at the Strong Female Antagonist blog, another thing that's relatively new. But you can also, if you follow me, you can find my writing around in places like Ghoul's Magazine and Room Org blog and, you know, nice. some such. Yeah. Yeah. Check those out, especially the Losers Club. I've been listening to them for a long time. Oh, I love the Losers Club. <laughs> Becca, where can we find you online? Yes, so I have my own blog, which is as told by Bex um, You can also find me on Twitter at as told by Bex, Instagram where I talk about books at read with Bex, and I also have been dabbling with TikTok, which is also as told by Bex. Dabbling with TikTok. All right. <laughs> I was trying to make it sound cute. <laughs> <laughs> I also talk about books there too, BT Dub. So basically, <laughs> books. <laughs> <laughs> Cassie, basically rainbows. Go. Basically yes. rainbows. <laughs> um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Control Alt Cassie. It's C T R L A L T C A S S I E. And then you can find my art and the books I make and stuff like that in my art shop, which is shopletsgetgalactic.com. 
And you can find me at Cooper S. Beckett, uh, my, my website, my social media, all the things. Um, I'm trying to be more positive on social media. <laughs> so maybe you can follow me if you if you want to see some positivity. I'm trying. I saw Ted Lasso, and I want to be a better man. Oh. <laughs> I mean, that's... That's the and and if if you don't understand that you watch Ted Lasso <laughs> because I don't care if you don't like soccer, it's amazing, just amazing. Um, yeah, Cassie, can you tell our listeners where they can find our show? You can find us on all social media at the Pikecast. It's all one word. We'd really like to see your book, so if you have some Christopher Pike books or a shelfie of books to share with us, use the hashtag showusyourpike and we can retweet it or share it to our stories. We also have a Goodreads group that you can join to talk about books with us, and we're on Patreon at the Pikecast. And if you join our Patreon, you can talk to us on Discord. Yay! Because we, uh, we, we do that. Like, you know, I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck that was. It's earlier than usual. <laughs> I'm doing this podcast for my bed. It's been so weird. <laughs> <laughs> I've only done one podcast from bed and it was really fucking weird. I'm just like laying down like I'm like should I should I should I talk? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the 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 downside of doing it from your bed is you start to think you're just listening to a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, ah, relaxing time. <laughs> it's like, this is a good show. I should listen to it. Wait a minute. I'm on it. <laughs> okay, listeners, your homework for next time is 1993's The Wicked Heart. Yay. <laughs> Sorry. So, I like that one. Sounds oh. like that's a Cassie favorite right there. All I, right. Thought, I thought that you just replaced woo with yay for some yeah, reason. Oh. <laughs> no, I still got the woo. Hang okay, on. Okay. Woo. No, you wait to the end for the woo. Oh, wait. Shit. <laughs> okay, okay, you threw okay. her off completely. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Just the yay for now. Oh, just the yay for now. Uh, first, I have to thank Jen again. Come on. <laughs> we got to be professional Jen? and shit, ladies. <laughs> oh, I'm professional Jen. before my woo. <laughs> <laughs> Jen, seriously, it, it has been a pleasure talking with you, and uh, you are you are more than welcome to be back anytime you would like. Oh, uh, thank because you. It, it's been a delight. Oh, so thank you. we will see you soon. And listeners, pleasant dreams. There you go. <laughs> you know, every time you, you you do that, I think of um, in Ghostbusters 2, when Janos comes to visit Dana, and he's all like, ooh, baby. And, and she says, no, he's sleeping. And he says, oh, but I woo. <laughs> I love Ghostbusters 2 so much. <laughs> My and I, don't, of the Ghostbusters I don't care what anybody says about Ghostbusters 2. That fucking Janos, every word out of his mouth is, is amazing. I know. It's Vigo. <laughs> yeah. You are like the buzzing of flies to him. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So I do good. a whole podcast about that yeah, movie. Yeah, just well. Ghostbusters 2. <laughs> Ghostbusters 2 cast. It's so good. You survived the night, friends. You can peek out from under your covers and see the first blues of dawn out the window. Thanks for spending the night with the Pikecast, and we hope you'll join us again next time. Until then, Pikers, pleasant dreams. <laughs> well, let's move into the section <laughs> Magic Fire. And, oh, wait, uh, we did something. Did we? Yeah. Oh, we, we did. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Cassie, you, you, uh, yeah. Um, hang on, sorry. My phone <laughs> shut off, and that's what I was looking at the questions on. <laughs> oh, you did miss something. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> Thank you, Becca. <laughs> okay. No problem. I really I... like... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 no. You go. Um, I, was, I really like... You said you oh, would like something. I was going to say something mean, so you start. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, 